You're at a difficult age. Neither child nor man. I don't know what to do with you. Your father died when we needed him mostly. He was not my father. What you mean? That he wasn't my father. I hated him. And I'm glad he's dead. Sebastian! He was with a whore the night he died. Shut up! He was with a whore! All women are whores! <laughs> Welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. I am Brad. Folks, we are here to celebrate good times. Come on. It's episode 250. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Don't hold your applause. <laughs> so, so, Brad, I'm going to make a little song um, of the next few things we say. Just go ahead and say something, and I will sample it, and I'll make it part of the song. So whatever you say, go for it. Okay. Most other people who have a podcast and get to episode 250 have done it in five years. Yes. Um, can I get a woo woo? Whoop, whoop. Okay. 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 Most other people who have a podcast can get to episode 250. 250, 250, 250. I've done it in five years. Can I get a woo-woo? Woo-woo. Woo-woo. Okay, okay, okay. Most other people who have a podcast can get to episode 250. 250, 250, 250. I've done it in five years. Can I get a woo-woo? Woo-woo. 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 This is the show that people are going to come back to and say, 250? Wow. Wow. Took them 15 years, but they did it. <laughs> Only 11. Come on. <laughs> Not mad at all. No, dude. It's it's freaking hilarious. I would have forgotten it if you hadn't said something. Because I was like, you're like, what number was this episode? I was like, oh, 240-something. You're like, what about episode 250? And I was like, hold up. If we're doing episode 250, let's pick a movie you don't want to watch or talk about. Let's do this. No, that's not that's not true at all. <laughs> I I agreed to stigma. I just it's easy for me to be excited once a year and be like, yeah, dude, I'm gonna be on so many shows this year. Hell yeah. And then then I don't answer your messages. Uh <laughs> no, I was listening to uh one of your solo shows that I very much enjoyed. And Yay. I thought, wonder, I was on, uh, it's on Podomatic, and I thought, I wonder if he's, he's recorded episode 250 yet? No. Nope. So, yeah, I've made a list of people that I want to shout out whenever we find that to be appropriate. Yeah, yeah. We'll make them wait. We'll make them wait for that shit. 
Yeah. Will they hear their name? We don't know. <laughs> or will will there be a big, long, months-long pause while I uh, gather together my list and try to remember to thank more people? Because I felt so bad when we did uh, the 10-year anniversary show. There were so many people I forgot, and I was like, oh, God, I suck. <laughs> now, my, my list is short, so I'm sure there's plenty of people that I'm forgetting. Uh, but, folks, tonight's film is from our pal, uh, Jose Ramon Larraz. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we talked about him, like, an episode uh, two or something? Yeah, Simpsons we did pretty early. Whew. It was before it had a Blu-ray. And weirdly enough, after all these years, I have been purposefully or unpurposefully avoiding some of his movies to kind of, like, give myself that surprise. So, like... Uh-huh. Um, the House That Vanished. I've still never seen it. Ugh, I uh, like that one. Uh, Deviation. I've still never seen that one. I've seen it, but I don't remember it. Uh, Whirlpool. I've still never seen that. I liked Whirlpool. There's the Tim Lucas commentary that was rather good Yeah. for Whirlpool. Yeah, so we're, we're going to do a... Uh, Brad's got a top five. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I've got a top three of uh, of Laraz. So we're gonna, we're going to come back to that later. Um I couldn't think of 5 only because I don't want to just list the ones I've seen. You know, I actually want to choose my faves. So we're going to do that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. But a stigma, we're about to spoil this whole movie. Now the problem with this movie, it's not super hard to find for watching. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, Dorado Films <laughs> they <laughs> they kind of folded. They were super inconsistent with release dates, to say the least. I think that was one of the big issues was the um, the finalizing of the discs. There was always some problem. Like mm. the, the timing was off or the menu was broken or something. They always had a, a lot of excuses for what was wrong. Ryan Santowski was not happy. Yeah, <laughs> poor Ryan. Yeah. But uh, I managed to snag the uh, Stigma and uh, uh, Emma Puertas Oscuras disc. Uh, it's it's worth a lot of money now, which is hilarious to me because, you know, there's a witch in this house. No, uh, Lietta finds that hilarious as well. She does. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like, dude. Stigma disc is gold. It's pure gold. Hey there, folks. It's Richard cutting in. Uh, apparently, you can still get some movies from Dorado. You just have to write to them. So I apologize for saying they folded. I don't know what's going on with them. So all I can say is try reaching out to Dorado Films and see what happens. Bye. Uh, So this is 1980 Stigma, a.k.a. E-Stigma. And so I have it filed under E and not S in my collection. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, But this was his return to horror. He had taken a little break from horror and decided to come back because... Jose uh, Jose Ramon Larraz, he liked the sexy movies. He left horror, but he never left our hearts. That's right. He made creepy shit, which is creepy because it's sexy. Because sexy is scary. I mean, not really. Terrifying. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> if it's the coming of sin, it might be terrifying. Or or Black Candles. Ooh. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, I'm not doing it. <laughs> There is no trailer for this one, dude. I cannot find a freaking really? trailer. You need to make a trailer. I'm you not, could do that. I could, but I don't have time. I'm not doing that. <laughs> well, I mean, you could make a doomed movie thon special trailer for E Stigma. I'm not Jeffrey in college where Jeffrey made his own trailers for like uh he made a trailer for <laughs> He make a trailer for Wednesday. It's Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> he, no, he did a trailer for something we covered, Runaway Nightmare. He he is like, oh yeah. I was like, yeah, it looks like a fan made trailer. He's like, that's because I made it. I'm like, oh my god, wow. Because <laughs> there was no trailer for it. So sadly, uh, you just have to use your imagination. Heck yeah. Uh, does did this even have a freaking VHS tape? I don't even know. I know it's popping up on some of those. Um, what do you call it? Uh, budget compilations. You know where I got my copy? Where? Netflix. Wow. Back in the in the mail 
uh, days back when Netflix was different. And it, I burned it, and it burned as a burned disc. Like when oh. you go, yeah, kind of like the uh, the Cinema de Bazaar, some of those films. Yeah. Where the menus chopped up. Good old days. Yeah, but I did. I got this from Netflix many moons ago. Sweet. Like, you can never watch this on Netflix. Like, they'll never put this up for streaming. No. But back in the day, you could get all these. I mean, there's tons of films. I got all kinds of Franco and I mean, just all kinds of obscure films that you could get in the mail. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, I, I loved it. I loved it. That was that was with the good old days. Yeah, it was. Even before that, before Netflix had, before Netflix existed, uh, that company started it called Rare Flix. Mm. And I actually gave them my credit card and was ordering the super obscure stuff from like, uh, like Shriek Show. Wow. And a couple of those other labels that had like the, just the stuff you couldn't find at like Suncoast Video because I was trying to. Sure. It was back when you had to buy everything just to see it. Mm hmm. Which, uh, thankfully, those days are pretty much over. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, actually, I think Stigma is also on YouTube in full. Yes, it is. In fact, there's two versions, the, the English dub and the Spanish language. I don't know if the Spanish, really? I don't know if the Spanish language is um, subtitled or not. But, uh, yeah, you can find this to watch pretty easily. Yeah. Hey, it's me again. I forgot to read the plot synopsis from IMDb, so... Here goes everything. The death of Sebastian's father engenders in him pathological fears and hallucinations. His death wishes seem to cause horrible accidents, which he is unable to control. When his older brother dies, he feels that he has caused it. He undergoes hypnosis, but his apparent supernatural powers continue. As his own life nears its end, he becomes even more violent and sadistic. <laughs> <laughs> Let us jump into this thing because I took too many notes. I was like, you know what? This movie is not complicated. Let me make it complicated. Sure. Do your thing. So this movie starts. It's called Estigma. We get a phone call. It turns out that uh, the patriarch of a family was killed in a car accident. So they, they call this guy named Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe is like, Woken up in the middle of the night, and he's like, "Oh shit! Okay, I'll I'll go to this this car accident." And he goes to tell his younger brother, uh, Sebastian. But Sebastian is like, "Yeah, I know. Like he knows that Dad is dead." Mm. And uh, the movie seems real broken here. We we fast forward to the funeral, and I mean, it feels like there are scenes missing. We get to the funeral in does. record time. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Sebastian, uh, this kid. The Sebastian. He is played by Christian Boromeo. Marameo, Marameo. <laughs> Marameo, Marameo. No, he's played by uh, Christian Boromeo. 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 He was in, of course, uh, Tenebre and Murder Rock. Mm -hmm. um, I like him in House on the Edge of the Park, which is probably the sleaziest movie I own in my collection. Yeah. It's one of those movies that I can't. I can't defend or explain because I don't like stuff that sleazy, but that movie has this weird tone. I think it's the late seventies Italian disco thing that keeps me coming back to it. I would normally not be down with something like that. I think I've seen it. Is it uh, like they're at a house and somebody yep. keeps them hostage mm -hmm. or something? Yeah. David Hess is the guy. That's yeah. I have seen it. Giovanni Rombardo Radice. Mm-hmm, the Radice. Yeah, I don't know why I like that one. But anyway, so he plays the, the younger son. Um, he's at the funeral, and <laughs> I wrote in my notes, I love grave lizards. <laughs> I was like, hold up, there's a lizard? It's got to be Tampa, right? Because we got a lot of those things all over the place. It's Argento. That's right. <laughs> God, look out, look out, lizard, you're going to have a pin stuck through you. Yep. So uh, we find out that um, Sebastian's mommy... Is played by uh, Helgeline, of all people. Yeah. And like anyone who's a son of Helgeline, he has a massive uh, incestuous crush on his mama. Absolutely, he does. <laughs> so he's watching her get ready for a date uh, because she moves a little fast. Uh, but he asks her, like, why are you put on so much lipstick? You know, 
when women leave lipstick on glasses, it makes me puke. Mm. <laughs> uh, but they're super close and touchy feely, and it's uh, it. You get, if you get a funky vibe, get used to it. Get used to it. Our pal. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, let me start that over. So, mom says, "Oh, Sebastian, you're at such a difficult age." And yes, <laughs> he he absolutely is. He's at the most difficult age. Uh huh. But uh, brother Joe walks in. Who is Joe played by? Is Emilio Gutierrez Caba? Whoa, whoa, prolific Spanish dude. Two hundred and seventeen freaking credits and counting. Dude, still going in the twenty twenty two. Holy shit. Wow. Dude is in it to win it. You know, I've mentioned this before, but Helga Lene was 41 in 73 when she made Horror Rises from the Tomb. Wow. She was 41. Damn. And strutting around naked. Yeah, and she's, you know, in 1980, she still looks amazing. Yeah. Uh, there's another actress in this that, unfortunately, she'd aged so much I didn't know it was her. And I felt really bad when I found out who it was. We'll talk about her later in the movie. <laughs> All right. Uh, but yes, our our pal uh, our pal Joe. He's he doesn't like his brother very much. He thinks that he and his mom need to deal with him. Like maybe uh, send him off to school, or it sort of feels like he wants to send him off to a mental mental institution. Yes. Mom explains that her son is sensitive and possibly psychic because of the Venetian veil he was born with. A call, and you know, I knew I knew a woman back in the nineties whose husband or ex-husband supposedly was born with a call, and it was bad news, according to her. Wow! So you you have no face when you're born; it's probably bad. Yeah, and you can tell the future. That's that's scientific fact. <laughs> Uh, so we real quick we meet uh, Sebastian's gal pal Martha. He seems to be uh, very infatuated with her, uh, but the moment she suggests hanging out with some friends, he's like, "Ugh, no, yuck! I don't like that. No, thank you." So uh, he just lets her go, and then we see um, him come home that night, and uh, he bumps into uh, his mom making out with a suitor. No, no, thank you. Mm-mm. Don't care for it. Get that ish out of here. Luckily, they weren't just banging. I guess if this movie had been in 72, they would have been having sex. But it's 1980, so they're just kissing. Because, you know. Right. Somewhat restrained. This movie is not totally restrained, but somewhat restrained. Especially for Laraz. Sebastian goes to his room to listen to some rock and roll. And uh, then he stabs his desk, which is not a euphemism for masturbation. He actually, like, takes a knife and stabs his desk. Yeah, but it's going to be now. Like, excuse me, I have to go stab the desk. <laughs> and <laughs> sitting on Pete's crotch. Oh, no, wait, that's smoking weed that Simon and I established. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, that's when his mom comes in and tells him, you know, that you're at a difficult age again. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I-, I told Elizabeth, I said, you're at a difficult age. 24. <laughs> so <laughs> he uh, is mad about this mother and a uh, new suitor thing. And, you know, he gets really mad. Um, he tells her that dad was with a whore when he died. And he screams, all women are whores. Which uh, I, we at the Doom Show do not uh, stand by this opinion. In fact, I think we think the opposite. No, it's yeah. Uh I mean, I do puke when I see lipstick on a glass, but I mean, that's yeah, that's normal. You, that's you, dude. No, all men are yeah, whores. I mean, oh, yeah, that's... Yeah. 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 Uh, so, Sebastian falls asleep listening to his rock and roll, and the movie's not clear whether or not this next scene is a uh, dream or not for quite a while. Then you find out it really happened, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he He and Martha... Uh, are are hanging out after after school presumably, and they climb to the top of this observation tower. And uh, while they're up there, she gets scared and decides this is this is creeping me out. I don't want to do this, so she tries to leave and and go back down these like massive flights of stairs. But he starts to harass her, getting a little handsy, trying to kiss her a little bit. Not good. No. So. Before she can get all the way down to ground level, 
he seems to have a weird moment and he starts to like stare off into the, the distance and the music it's all creepy and the next thing you know uh, they're throwing her dummy off of the freaking uh, third or fourth story of this thing and uh, his lip is bleeding so she's dead on the ground covered in blood and he's got a cut in his lip that just miraculously bleeds we find out why later much later much later it's worth it's worth noting that he's a bloody lippy boy Ugh. Ugh. He's leaving blood stains on glasses. <laughs> See what a hypocrite. <laughs> uh-huh. So he, he's uh he's freaking uh he's he's just in a church trying to pray and he gets interrupted by uh <laughs> Is this Craig Hill? No. Who is this actor? Is it Massimo? No, Serato's later. I think it is Craig Hill. I'm trying to... I'm, I, Craig Hill played a priest in a different movie. Mm-hmm. With the Bloodstained Shadow, right? Yeah, okay, thank you. God, it's so funny. Like, I know who he is, but I can't. Mm-hmm. I just can't get it. Freaking Craig Hill playing a priest again. I can't believe I'm getting mixed up because he's so amazing in Bloodstained Shadow. Uh, Bloodstained Shadow is so good. He has the best line in this entire movie. What is it? Where they're they're talking, they're discussing, and then he's like, "Here, try these cookies. They're delicious." I don't know what to do, Father. Sometimes I, I feel afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of, unless you're afraid of yourself. Hmm. No. Here, try some of these cookies. They're delicious. Yes. Yes, I wrote that down. You know what's more you know what's even more confusing, Brad? You ready you ready for this shit? So Massimo Serrato, the guy I started to mix up with him. Mm-hmm. He was also in the Bloodstained Shadow. Yeah, he was. What I can't I feel like I'm losing my mind. Crazy. Uh, yeah, and that's that's just two years apart, right? Is it seventy or is it seventy seven? I can't 78. remember. Seventy eight. Yeah. That's what oh, I thought. That's so weird. That's so weird. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it's great. Like this priest is giving him some jacked up dumbass advice, and it's taking all of uh, Sebastian's like I guess fondness for this preacher uh, or priest not to uh, roll his eyes. <laughs> He's like, I talked to a great man once, and he said blah 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 blah, <laughs> <laughs> and then try some of these cookies, man. <laughs> They're delicious. <laughs> they remind me of the biscuits from uh, the church. These biscuits are groovy. They're groovy, man. <laughs> well, he should have offered him some onions. Onions. Yep. Don't keep me waiting on those cookies, Herman. That's right. Uh, so we go to the home of Olga and dumbest dumbass in this movie, who's just dumb. Angie. Oh, my God. Mm, you know, yes. Angie... Baby, if you're out there, and I know you're you're not, but you need to stop being dumb. <laughs> yeah, she. <ugh. laughs> anyway, so Angie is Joe's uh, girlfriend, maybe maybe fiance. I don't know how like far along into their relationship they are, uh, but she's played by Alexandra Bastedo, not Bastardo. Okay, no. Uh, she was in a movie I cannot get through called The Blood Spattered Bride. Mm-hmm. And it's all my fault, folks. The rapey stuff, um, it, it don't appeal to me. Uh, I'm not saying I'll never finish it. I have a feeling I'm probably missing out, but yeah. I had seen it, and then you watched it, and you were mad at me. I don't remember being mad at you. You were mad at me. I was like... It was okay. I was like, dude, why did you make this shitty film so shitty, dude? No, I think it was either the animal violence or the rape. And I was like... I think I was like, dude, you could have given me a heads up on that. Which, I don't think that's fair of me. So I apologize, because, you know, you don't control... You don't control movies. It was still early. I got to where I was on the lookout for those items. You know? Yeah. Either way. Either way, it all worked out. I just never watched it. So, uh, <laughs> this uh, Bastardo woman, um, she was in the original Casino Royale. Mm-hmm. And she was also in the Saint TV show a couple episodes. Uh, the thing I have seen with her 
that I'm like, what? Uh, she was in The Ghoul from 1975, Freddie Francis. Wow, uh, Workman and I were just talking about yeah. that. He'll never listen to this because he doesn't listen to podcasts. But mm. neither neither do I, Chris. Don't worry about it. Her birthday is coming up. Her birthday is March 9th, one day after mine. Whoa. See? She died young at 67. Olga, her her, her older pal, she lives with uh, Olga, who, is she supposed to be her aunt? Is she just her friend, roommate? I don't understand their relationship. Mm, no. Olga certainly has some feelings for her pal, Angie, which uh, we'll get to a little bit later. But this is Irene Gutierrez Caba, uh, another Spanish actress here of quite a few things. I'm just scrolling with the homies. Scrolling with the homies. I don't think I've ever seen anything else she did, which is fine. Um, but she is like uh, doing something in the kitchen. She cuts her finger and then she tells Angie that this is a, uh, a sign that things are going to be bad. And she says, the time is propitious. No, she doesn't say that. Um, I do love in uh, Spanish dubbed horror films when they say propitious. I like it. Yeah. Olga is psychic, and she knows Sebastian is coming, and she's like, dun dun dun. And I wrote in my notes, hold up, Angie is stunning. That actress is really beautiful, I should say. She really is. Uh, They hang out. We have a nice little uh, dinner date, but there's a lot of suspicious glances going around. Um, they're, They're talking about charnel houses and burial grounds like this apartment they live in was bare was uh, built on a burial ground or some shit yeah uh they get into a religious debate versus like religion versus psychic phenomenon debate elizabeth says that her house looks like a hotel lobby it does it does not look like a comfortable like domicile for people to live in it's a good call uh. yeah. oh dude there's lipstick on a glass in the scene and sebastian don't like it no likey uh, so we go back to Sebastian's room, and he's having visions, and he sees himself hung, bro. I dream about my Sebastian being much bigger than it actually is in real life. That's, is that a thing? It is now. <laughs> my Borromeo is too small in real life. <laughs> But he has a cool painting, and I want to look this up, so... Because I don't know what this painting is, but it's really surreal, and I've seen it before, and Google just failed me. You know, I know what you're talking about, because the, like, the ship, like, the big ship in the door, I did not recognize, but then there was something else that I did. It was the face. face. Yes. Yes. Damn it. Ugh, surreal. Painting. This is gonna be a fun part to edit. Surreal painting. Yeah. Face. Thirty minutes later. Leaves. Oh, uh, Ted messaged me and told me to tell you hi. Hi, Ted. Ted Rossum is awesome. Ted Adore Rossum. So, folks, if you've seen Estigma, look for that surreal painting uh, with uh, the ship floating down a hallway, and there's this face. That, it looks like a collage, but it's obviously been painted. It's just this beautiful, creepy painting. Yeah, it really is. In my mind, uh, when I watched it last night, I thought, is this an album cover? It was probably used, somebody probably used it. Maybe like Genesis used it as one of their album covers or something. Peter Gabriel looked at it and went, yoink. Yoink. Uh, After he sees himself hung, we cut to Olga just straight up telling Angie, like, this kid is evil. And I think she actually says in the English dub, he's a horrible danger zone. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> they did some funny acrobatics in this movie uh to make they really did. to make sure that the li- the the English talking matched the lips. I would be very curious to watch this in its original intention and see. Although, you know, Laraz filmed a lot in English anyway. He did. Sebastian is a horrible danger zone. We must avoid him. And that's when Olga gives her this awkward kiss like she leans over and is like, "Take care, my friend." I'm leaning in for a kiss, and Angie's like, what are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Oh, boy. It just lingers a little too long, dude. It's just like The Holiday starring uh, Jack Black and uh, uh, what's-her-face from Titanic movie. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio. That's the the girl. So uh, our our buddy uh, Angie works at a bookstore, and she works at a bookstore that stocks a book about Roddy McDowell. Did you catch this? Yes, I saw the Roddy McDowell. What the look. hell? 
it was in the window. It was awesome. I, I paused it and I'm like, look, it's Roddy McDowell. Dude, so he has a cameo in this movie. He does. Oh my God. Not even in his IMDb. Oh boy. Our buddy Sebastian is watching her and uh, over drinks that night, uh, Joe and her are on a date at a bar and he's like, man, my brother is taciturn. And I was like, holy <laughs> shit, dude. Like someone used the word taciturn. That's incredible. Amazing. Uh, Joe explains that Sebastian is a bad seed um, who was happy when their daddy died. And, uh, mm -hmm. of course, Sebastian is stalking them while they're on their date. Uh, and then we get more fun where Sebastian uh, pulls a tape recorder out from under a bed. I was a little confused at first, but I think this was him recording his mother's lovemaking. Mm -hmm. But he could have also been recording uh, his brother's lovemaking as well, but... Well, there's a lot of love making going on. Yeah, dude. So he goes to take a shower. This is what's known as a shower scene. And uh, we don't get to see his, his floppy little Borromeo. Borromeo. Mm -hmm. But a woman who shows up who might be Martha and who might be someone else, a ghost, a ghostly visit happens. Right. She comes out of the shower in the coolest way. She's in the tub, but she doesn't sit up. She floats up turning from the tub and he like backs away like he's like oh shit and then in the mirror she falls screaming that scare got me and i knew it was coming because it got me wow. so good the first time uh-huh i was anticipating it and i was waiting and waiting and waiting and then boom and it scared me again <laughs> nice dude what the fuck it's so good it is I want to say there's another scare coming later that I really like. But uh, we see uh, after this, we see Joe and Angie making the sex act. And uh, they're just, he's going away for a few days. And it's a very lovely scene. I don't even know why I wrote it down. And then uh, Angie is like getting annoyed with Olga because Olga's giving Angie yet another warning. And I'm getting mad at Angie because she is not heeding these warnings. Mm hmm. You need to be heeding the fuck out of these warnings, lady. Uh, she goes on a boat ride with Sebastian, and he's visited by the, the spirit of this mysterious girl ghost who may or may not be Martha watching him from the water. Oh, yeah. So Sebastian that night comes home, and he's kind of spying on mom and her lover. They're, he's made it very awkward for them, I think, because they're not making out. They're not doing anything. They're just kind of sitting and smoking and not talking. And then Sebastian, like, totally throws some shade at this new lover guy. <laughs> yeah. Like, just slams the door in his face. <laughs> <laughs> Olga gets the, she has a vision of Sebastian smiling at her, and this is going to give her this super smart idea that is going to drive the rest of the movie. And so she's like, don't go to high places with Sebastian. That's right. Now, Brad, did you read into the, the phrase, high in this high places? Sure, sure did. No dispensaries. LOL. 420 spliff. That's right. This was in the days of illegal marijuana. Nowadays, you, you pack a bong with the, the, the mint leaves. Yeah. And drink some CBD tea. <laughs> CBD PT? Yeah. Some PP baloney. <laughs> PP baloney. If that's your thing. <laughs> It's not mine. All God's children, right? <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. So after this warning of not to go to high places, she immediately goes on a sky ride with him. One of those freaking uh, dealies that hangs above the city perilously. He tells her about his bloody lip problem. And she says, hey, when I was 14, I too had a bloody lip problem. Are you saying lip? Okay. Okay. No, I don't have that problem, young man. No, I thought it's maybe bloody lisp. <laughs> I'm not going to do a lisp. That's not cool. <laughs> no. I, I almost did. Uh, but she doesn't believe in his superpowers because he's telling her like how he can freaking command people to die and shit. And he, he goes home and his brother's mad at him about skipping school and being a, a just a dumbass at college or whatever. But we all know that uh, he's really mad because he's been hanging out with Angie. I wrote in my notes, wah, wah, the kids at school don't like me, wah, wah, just because I might have murdered Martha. <laughs> yeah, wah. I mean, 
I mean, I might have murdered Martha. Poor kid. Joe threatens to pack him up and send him off to boarding school. And uh, Sebastian, using his powers, causes his brother to have a little bit of a fender bender. To death. Just a little. Uh, at this point, Mom is starting to wise up. And she's like, there's too many coincidences. Blah, 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 blah. And then we see Sebastian coming in to see his mom in the middle of the night and just caressing her face while she's asleep. Yeah, normal stuff. Oh, boy. Uh, Angie, for some reason, agrees to meet with uh, Sebastian, and she just wants to know, why'd you kill Joe? Yeah. What's up with you? I mean, she's for real. She's not like, your brother died mysteriously. She's like, you killed him. And now I want to hang out with you because I have no control over my own life. Yeah, well, he says, I can't control my thoughts. It's like, bro, his name is Professor Xavier. It's right around the time (laughs) you could go become one of the new mutants. Do some good with this murder powers you got. That's correct. We cut back to him sniffing his mother's underneath clothes, which is always, always good, I guess. Uh... He's visited by Martha once again. But this time she's got a pal. It's uh, Joe. So she's got these two freaking ghostly, ghastly, pallid freaking people staring at him. And it's so creepy. Pallid people. I like that. You like that? Pallid. Uh, yeah, I do. Or just powdered people. Powdered, pallid people. I mean, <laughs> up up with people. <laughs> oh, no, it's 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 down with people, I'm afraid. Oh, jeez. He sees some skeletons, and we get some amazing uh, fisheye lens floating around, some frickin' uh, skeletons, and I wrote in my notes, skeletons, ah! It's scary. Angie visits with him yet again, apologizes for being mean to him, and I'm like, why? He killed your frickin' boyfriend, dipshit? I mean... <laughs> I mean, for real. But she says Olga can help him. And I honestly thought this viewing, because I hadn't thought about, I couldn't remember how this movie ends. Um, I thought she was like trying to trick Sebastian to get revenge on him. But no, no, she's like legit. She's trying to help him. Olga wants to delve into his mind. So they have a nice say a seance. Oh, I wish. They have a hypnotism scene, which is one of my other favorite things in horror movies. They hypnotize this little biatch named Sebastian, and he tells Olga about this old mansion where there's a tower. Yeah. There is no tower at the mansion. Just No. I think they just wanted to tie all this stuff together. In the dubbing. Try try these cookies. They're delicious. (laughs) We'll talk about the guy who they called in. Uh, to help doctor up this uh, screenplay. Oh, yeah. I did read about that. So, very interesting. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. And, of course, LaRaz is very funny about that. So, he tells him about the old mansion with the tower, and then um, he sees who we think is is Martha, but it's not Martha. This is, um, I believe this is Julia? Hmm. Julia Dream. I believe this is Julia. This is a different girl. She's very similar um, hair, similar body type. So, of course, I was getting confused. But no, it's a different actress. And, of course, it's his sister. This is his sister. Apparently, our buddy Sebastian is having one of those past life regression dealies. Mm -hmm. And then we see his father. And it's like, hold up. That's his father? And that, of course, is uh, Massimo Serrato. Yes, sir. Sebastian's name in this past life was Michael. So in case I start calling him Michael, that's what I'm doing. We get some incest, of course, because we need more incest. Except this time it's not Mommy in the past. It's his sister in the past. Yes. He talks about hiding in the cellar. It's the only place he feels safe or it feels alive. And then he hangs himself in the cellar. And I wrote in my notes, Angie, through all of this, still doesn't want to cut this kid loose. Nope. She's drawn to him like a moth to a wet burp. Yes. (laughs) Which I just made myself laugh because I'm a dummy. It was good, though. Thank you. Thank you. Um, And I wrote in my notes, living it up when you're Sebastian. Loving it out. Stuck in an elevator. Mm Mm-hmm. Seeing some ghost legs when you're walking down or something. I don't know. I didn't. I should have worked on it. (laughs) <laughs> no, that was perfect. 
So Sebastian, there was just a random ghost sighting. It had nothing to do with anything. Uh, but then uh, Sebastian recorded his hypno his hypno session. So now he knows where to go because in the uh, in the the session he actually named the place this mansion. He gave it a name. See, I did not. I could not make that connection whatsoever. It's just all of a sudden he's in a taxi, and I thought, how 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 did he know where to go? Exactly. Exactly. He's uh, he's cruising in this taxi with someone uh, credited as Taxista. 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 And uh, this is Jose Maria. Excuse me, Jose Maria Caffarel. And just like every other person in this freaking movie is in two hundred and fifty freaking credits. Oh my god! Wow. Jeez. These legends, dude. The le- the legends. The Leggins. Uh, he was in a, a movie I want to see called Leonore, which is a Boonwell film from 1975. Looks interesting. I bought Elizabeth a Boonwell a set from Criterion for Valentine's Day. Nice. Very sweet. She, yeah, she wanted it, so I gave it to her. Cool. Yeah, Um, I know very little about Boonwell. I think I've seen maybe two of his movies. I don't even know which ones. We've seen The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie. I think I've seen that in college. I think I rented that from the library. Yeah, it was good. Uh, but yeah, so this taxi boy, uh, he's got all the info. He just does a freaking exposition dump all over the movie. Just splat. Dude. Um, I did. I actually wrote in my notes, he's an exposition exposition dumper. Dumper. Uh, he, he talks about the mysterious deaths at the property. Young women were being killed drowned in a well and i said hold up is that samara or sadako let him out Uh uh-huh die in seven days brother yes get get someone else that tape yo (laughs) he goes to the mansion which is this amazing mansion i was so disappointed there wasn't more details about where this was filmed uh because this house looks so familiar to me it's so beautiful i'm sure i've seen other films shot there you're bound to. Uh, but he, he breaks in and goes inside, and they do an, an amazing Pepper's Ghost uh, effect, where um, he you see him, and you think that he's like a ghost, but he's just reflected in this glass door. And then he mm-hmm. opens the door and walks in, and as he's shutting the door, the ghost of that woman, uh, Julia, is there in there. It's like, oh, such a sweet, I'm I'm guessing an in-camera effect that's like really cool. Uh, did you say peppers? Yeah, I believe it's called a pepper's ghost. It is huh. It is a, a thing. I used to not know what it was, but my favorite band, folks, Terra Mellos. You got to check out Terra Mellos. And the song that they did is called System Preferences, and he references a, uh, a pepper's ghost. It's an, huh. an illusion technique used in theaters, uh, cinema, amusement parks, museums, etc., where you basically arrange the room so that there's a film of a glass or plexiglass and it's angled so that when you're looking at it, you see the reflection of something. Mm-hmm. It looks like it's in front of you. So you have someone standing in the darkness and then when you light them off stage, they're reflected in that plexiglass. So it looks Neat. like they're right in front of you. Yeah. It's called a pepper's ghost. Those old boys at Terramelos, man. Yeah. Dude, if I if I didn't think we'd get the frickin' episode taken down, I'd play a little sample of uh, System Preferences, because it's a frickin' great song. How does the algorithm know? Um, it's just the frickin' record labels. Like, anytime you have given your music to any of these streaming services, um, it just it makes the entire song, like, flaggable by the bots. Hmm. Which is why I don't play much music from these movies on anymore. So if a move if a movie's super obscure and the soundtrack has never been released, I'm pretty confident I can sneak it in. I have got to say that the episode that I listened to was your favorite slashers. Yes. And the theme song was very, very good. Oh yeah? Your theme song, the one that you did. With the voices, the same. Oh, all the quotes stuff. from the movies. Oh, yeah, dude. That that's my little intro. I I mean, I've heard I've heard it before. I just I don't listen to our show much. Oh. Ooh, I listen to our show like all the time because I'm a psycho. 
I, I mean, you're our downloads. This We record this for you. I looked up our downloads and it was like this insane amount of downloads for a year of podcasting. It's like 11,000 uh-huh. or something. Really? <laughs> and I'm like, that's just me, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> wow, I had... This is live. This I had no idea we had that many. That's <laughs> that's crazy. Like the last time we talked about it, we were like at thirty. Yeah, we we get like I'm guessing like three hundred to six hundred listens an episode. Or hey, careful with that budge. Sorry, Ernie. It's the rookie's first time covering cookies. Do I have to use so much fudge? We're elves. We always use lots. Lots of rich, creamy fudge makes our good Keebler cookies taste even more uncommonly good. Keep your eye on a cookie, kid. Making Keebler fudge-covered cookies takes lots of fudge. And lots of practice. Fudge sticks, fudge stripes, fudge marshmallows, and deluxe Grahams from Keebler. I meant to say earlier in this recording that this is the first time that we have recorded in back-to-back weeks yeah. in a hundred years. Holy shit, yes. yes. It has been a long time. And if it worked for my birthday next oh week, we, uh, if you had time, we'd do it the third week. Yeah, dude. I'm all about striking while the iron's hot and getting you lots of content this dude, year. Dude, I'm all about getting parts of my body stuck to that iron because it's so hot. Heck. Yes, yes. Mm, ow. We're going to try to avoid that. but All right. So we get the ghost, and then all of a sudden, it's raining outside, and bam, mm-hmm. Angie jumps in. Hey, what's up? I followed you here, dude, because I knew where you were going to be, because I was there at your hypno session, brother. That's, that's right. Your mom said, where were you? And I said, he's at the haunted house. <laughs> I said, Angie scares are the new jump scares. Look out, Hollywood. Look out, Hollywood. Total Angie scare. Totes. Ugh, this movie, this movie's filled with Angie scares. <laughs> God, I hate my life. Ah, man, Annabelle in space is dumb, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so things be spooky, and uh, Sebastian, Ooh. Sebastian's just freaking out. He's like, can't you smell the blood? And of course, mm-hmm. uh, he takes a nap, and Angie's watching over him while he sleeps. Um, he wakes up, and he's haunted by the bloody bodies apparently and that's when he is now in the past this is when he's turned into michael so michael and his sister are very close she pays him a naughty visit in the night i have to say jose ramon laraz you're naughty because she is insanely gorgeous yes and well, Christian Borromeo is also a beautiful specimen. Um, True. So I was conflicted about their incestuousness. <laughs> Hopefully they were not related in real life. Hopefully not. Yeah, that would... You didn't need yeah. that kind of realism. No, sir. <laughs> and she's a gosh darn pillow biter. She's a pillow biter, it's for sure. Yeah, she's she's riding him like he's the last biscuit on the old Burger King Expressway. Mm-hmm. Which is a famous phrase coined just now. Yes, people use it. <laughs> tell, Live it. <laughs> tell your friends if you don't want to keep them as your friends. Right. <laughs> tell your truth. Yes, tell the priest <laughs> that it's offering you cookies about it. Yeah, use your words. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, so th- the next day, presumably, in this flashback, um, his father be scolding, daddy be scolding. He's like, get back to your studies. Uh-huh. And they have this whole, what is the capital of Estonia? What is the capital of this country? What is this country's capital? Blah, 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 blah. And he's an idiot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, he is. I think he tells his sister... That killing a person is doing them a favor, and I was very confused about what that was about. Um, but of course, um, his sister's getting married, and he's a bit jelly. Uh huh. I said in my notes, this will probably not end well. Yeah. So of course he goes Lizzie Borden on these here bitches. He takes an axe and he gives them at least eight point six wax. But we need to talk about mom. So, mm-hmm. it, so this is who you were talking about yes. earlier. In the present day, Sebastian's mom is Helga Line, which is fantastic. In the mm-hmm. flashbacks, his mother is played by Annabella Incontrera, 
one you know, of that's what I thought. One of those Giallo vixens from back in the day. Second mm-hmm. viewing, second viewing had no idea who it was. I had no clue that it was her. I didn't either. I'm guessing, and this is this folks, you can you can shame me. I'm not trying to be a dick. I think she maybe had had a child at some point. Mm. Because she's she looks like a different woman completely. And she's still a very very beautiful and it's, and knowing it's her makes her even more beautiful to me because she's one of my favorite actresses just of all time. Yeah, she's got a look. And so yes, that is Annabella in Contrera, dude. Like this is just like our pal um oh jeez, why is her name flying out of my head? She's in a film called The Crimes of the Black Cat. Yeah, dude. Oh my uh-huh. god, but who Directed am I trying to somebody? Yeah, I'm trying to think of that's true. Oh, good call. I'm trying to think of the freaking just like our buddy Anita Strindberg, who was mm. in Murder Obsession in nineteen eighty. This uh-huh. was her last film. Was it really? Yeah, Annabella Incontrera, this was her last film, you know. She Amazing. She showed up in a TV movie in twenty eleven, mm-hmm. but it was posthumous. She had already passed away, so it may have been like footage, uh-huh. footage they used from something else. Right. Uh, so she was just like, I'm done. And she seems a little tired in this. Like, she's not much of a character, mm-hmm. <laughs> sadly. Uh, Anita Strindberg, I, I don't know why she retired, because she's amazing in Murder Obsession. You're like, what are you doing? She really is. She's tired of that grind, y'all. So he, he kills both of them with the axe, um, and then he attacks his sister, and uh, she hurts his <laughs> lip. Yes. Yep. But I told, I told Elizabeth, I said... She jumped out of a bath quicker than anyone has ever jumped out of a bath. <laughs> I would have slipped and fallen to my death. He wouldn't have had to kill me. I would have. Yeah, it had been over. <laughs> uh, we get this great shot of her in the curtain. Like, they've she got, like, a, a privacy curtain, which is weirdly see-through for some reason. Mm-hmm. And it's just, oh, yes. so beautifully staged and so freaking haunting. Oh, my God. Well, it's something Ooh. that... That I have to continually think about while we're recording this is that you watched a nice pristine oh, Blu-ray. Oh yes, yes. And I watched uh, a VHS <laughs> a gr- rip that yep. had been thrown on a disc. A grubby bootleg. Yep. Grubby bootleg. Um, and I will say this about the uh, the Dorado Blu-ray: they didn't put much work into the restoration. They just found a really? they just found a good print of it. They did not Yeah. I don't think they did shit to it. It looks nice. They probably didn't. Perfectly reasonable and it sounds great. Mm-hmm. But yeah, don't mm-hmm. worry, you're not missing the crisp clearness. <laughs> mm. Back in the present day, Angie and Sebastian are making out and I'm like, "Angie girl, come on." He mm-hmm. starts choking her and kills her and I'm like, "Yep, did not see that coming, boy." <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, so he kills her, and he starts running around the house, and he's all alone, and he's just totally nuts. And he runs away from the house, and we see him laying in bed, ghastly pale and sickly looking, like sweating and staring at the ceiling. It almost looks like his eyes are rolled back in his head. And yes. you realize that this corpse is alive, but he's like laying in bed, totally mad. Like he's lost his mind completely. And he's listening to an audio tape. What is the tape? It sounded like I thought it was his mother. Oh, might might have been Olga. I don't know, but I thought it was his mother. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes, and she was saying she was saying like stuff. I I wish I'd been paying attention. My my note for all the overly long amount of notes I took, I've totally lost it by the end. But we get the haunting music, the oppressive music, Mm -hmm. which um, I didn't really talk about the score too much because one of the things i might complain about is while the music is good it's very spare not a lot of music in this but the composer is uh daniele petucci he's one of the lesser known dudes um he did a great score for frankenstein 80 and he did uh music for uh sex of the witch Right. And a music I vaguely remember. I want to listen to this score again. I forgot to listen to it because I just noticed he did it. Uh, he did Plot of Fear. You know, I have so many times over the past couple of years, I have that DVD. Yeah. 
We watched it once. Yes. And I often think I should watch Plot of Fear again. Dude, I would love to cover it with you because, like, it's. Let's do. Yeah, let's do that in the it's, future. It's a very different film. Oh, I got a spasmo. Spasmo. It is. Spasmo. 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 What are you doing? She was. She talked for Simon. I'm trying to get her to talk for you. Spasmo. Come on, son. She's looking at me like, "What are you doing? Pet me, dumbass." She's very confused as to why I'm completely. Not... All right, I'm petting her. All right. All right. There you go. I think we should cover Plot of Fear. That'd be really fucking sweet. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. It's Ka- um, Kavara. Is that right? The director? Yes. Um, do, do, do. I, like, I, it's I, not. I closed the window. It's, yeah, it's not a traditional giallo, really. No, it's it's very different. It has, I think it has like some some uh, reveals and some kills that are giallo-like. But yeah, uh, yeah it's it's got a different vibe to it. It's 76, so it's you know one of the later ones. Uh huh. I did find a film that is a lost horror film when I was doing my little uh, snooping around. the uh, The cinematographer of this movie, uh, Giuseppe Bernardini, he shot a film called Mostro Sita from 1979, and it is lost. It is a gone film. I can't even find a poster for it. All I know wow. is that it's horror, mm-hmm. and it's a Spanish. Oh, it's a, it's a Spanish-Italian co-production. Mm. The dude who wrote um, was one of the writers on uh, Naked Girl Killed in the Park worked on it. Nice. Yeah, but I'm That's like... That's an OG, OG Giallo from you. Do you remember your, your Carlo DeMeo joke? Because uh, Carlo DeMeo's in it. No, I don't think I do remember. I have a a, a message saved on my phone from probably like seven or eight years ago. Where, uh-huh. where you said, um, Did you know that Carlo DeMeo had a brother named Hold? Yes, his name was Hold DeMeo. <laughs> I can't remember the whole joke now. I'll have to see if I can get it off my phone and put it in this episode. Uh, <laughs> That'll well, be, I'm sure it's hilarious. It's very hilarious. I just can't remember the whole joke. It'll be the episode 250. Uh, it'll be the Easter egg in this episode. <laughs> Heck yeah. Giuseppe Bernardini, who shot this bad boy, he shot uh, The Other Hell, and he shot uh, Sweets from a Stranger, which is a freaking amazing 80s giallo. Yeah. Unfortunately, he also worked on Fatal Frames. Ah, well, no way's perfect. Dude, I had someone defend Fatal Frames so hard to me in that giallo group, the Nice Ties group. Uh-huh. Dude, he was like, you don't understand how hard it was to make that film. It was a freaking labor of love. And he begged, borrowed, and stealed, stole to get it made and all this stuff. I'm like, dude, it's, no. It's two care. hours and change, bro. Mm-hmm. At 90 minutes, that movie would have been a classic. Like, it's a bad movie, but it's a, it's fun bad. But then you got that like, extra 40 minutes and shit. On, oh, my God. I think Ooh. I think uh, David Ladd has wanted us to cover that. Oh, it's already done. Oh, okay. Jeff, Good. Jeffrey and I did it I, forever ago. I didn't do it. No, you didn't. Not I me. would no. Jeffrey's like it's gonna be great. I'm like you. Ooh. I mean, I'm glad we did it. And no, you know, sure. hey, I've never made a film. I've made short films. I can't imagine making a 70 minute movie, much less a two hour and change epic. But man, mm-hmm. I I can't stand that movie. Holy crap. Amazing. Whew. Whew. Let's see. We have some words from our pal um, Jose Ramon Laraz about this film mm-hmm. from the uh, liner notes of the uh, Dorado Films Blu-ray here. He says, it says, his return to the horror film in 1979 slash 80, A Stigma, is a very caring project from the beginning where Laraz puts his heart into it and he says in his memoirs, this is the weird translation, folks. The script, the script, the script was, <laughs> that's very weird. The script was written entirely by me, although to cover some fudge of the co-production, it was signed also by another writer, an Italian mm-hmm. whom I did not even know. <laughs> uh huh. And that Italian was Sergio Pastore, who you uh, yes. name dropped a little bit earlier, the uh, director yeah. of... Uh, the Crimes of the Black Cat. Yeah. Do you have that Blu-ray? I did. It's not bad. 
No, I've got it too. Yeah. yeah. It's 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 per, it's a lot better than the one I had. Oh god, yes. He says, uh, Laraz says, Stigma was a full-fledged horror film. I believe we have succeeded in providing the desired restlessness effect. I think we all enjoyed shooting that movie and none more than I. Classic. It's funny to me, Brad. You know how we always talk about a, a film that's very personal to the director yes. is a bad film? Yeah. <laughs> right. I have my thoughts about how I feel about this movie. But I want to hear, unless you have some more, any any trivia or any, like, sweet, sweet sauce. No, I I could tell you. So we got this and watched it before you saw it. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we got ready to watch it again last night for the show. And I said, this is a film that I remember losing attention. And then looking up at the end, it was amazing. But there had been, I said, there's some sort of change in there. And I'm not sure. I don't remember. So we got uh, Culver's last night, which is a fast food chain. And they've got, oh, we got a particular meal. Oh, excellent. There's a particular meal that fits our Weight Watchers. I got a ch grilled chicken sandwich, but that's pretty carby for what we eat. So while watching it, I fell asleep last night. <laughs> it opens and it's, you know, a Carrie-ish, the Fury type, you know, guy with... And then I wake up and they're gone back in time. It's a gothic like, movie. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what has happened? So... I watched it from that point on, then rewound it and watched what I'd missed. So my first thought is, this would have been an amazing film to see when you were a child. Because can you imagine trying to explain this to somebody? I saw this <laughs> film and this guy, he was killing people with his mind. And then they go back in time and he has <laughs> sex with his sister. And then he... He has a he hatchets his family to death, and then in, like in the future he kills his girlfriend. So it would have been, and it the logic of this movie is very very dreamlike, and I don't know if the editing of it has something to do with that as well because it does feel like there are chunk like maybe small chunks missing. Yeah, that's exactly how this version feels to me. Yeah, the first part where he's carrying it up all over the place. Uh, I like, but when they go back in time, I think that's really where the film is just out and out amazing. Yeah, yeah. There, like, the contrast between him and and the girl in the present, and for him going back in time or reliving or whatever. There's a a shot that gave me the vibe. Yes. And I don't get the vibe a whole lot, but the, where, there, where the camera is tracking down the hallway and the music is playing, oh I get the vibe God. big time. And then you see her by the bathtub, dead. Just absolutely amazing, the hallway scene. It's very dreamlike, but I thought I'd seen it before, and then I remember you seeing it, loving it, and kind of looking at Elizabeth going, I need to see that again because I don't remember it being awesome. But it really is. <laughs> um, I love I love Laraz, and I think it being a personal film like you just spoke of, uh, I think it probably was. He had been out of, of horror for a little while, had done some you know sexy type films that I don't think either one of us have a whole lot of desire to see it's just not our thing but i think this really like a minor classic of just dreamlike abandoned i'll always think about you in the house by the cemetery and how you saw that film and i've got a similar film that's nowhere near as good but uh nightmares or voices it's gonna get a blu-ray release oh yeah uh, yeah dude. oh my god uh i saw that at my great grandmother's house on a saturday afternoon when I was five or six, I mean, I was young. That's why. And all I could remember was the ending, and of course, that gives away the whole film. But I've been, re I've got it on. I've got a bootleg. I ordered it from um, Trash Palace, and they kept sending me, they kept sending me Nightmare in a Damaged Brain. <laughs> 
and I and I kept telling him, I said, oh "This God. is not this is not what I ordered, oh so I could send God, this back." Dude. And he's like, "No, just keep it. Just keep nightmares and a damaged brain." And I think they did it twice. They sent me nightmares and a damaged brain twice because nightmares obviously is a generic uh, a generic title, and I think it's so funny that at five or six I saw a film with David Hemmings and his wife at the time, Gail Honeycutt, that would, would I got older, I mean, Deep Red is one of the main reasons that I found you was because early on I was Googling Giallo and, of course, Do Movie Thon and Cinema Subnamulus were coming up. And then his wife, Gail Honeycutt, is in The Legend of Hell House, which we watch every single Christmas Eve. Uh, Because it's a Christmas movie. So I think it's so interesting that that was so important. I wish I had bought the Dorado Blu-ray. It would have driven me crazy waiting 40 years for it to come Uh, out. That's why I don't pre-order. I hate pre-ordering now. I would have just, I would have just given up, you know? So I wish I had, I don't know about Emma, the other film. Oh, it's great. It's, uh, is it really? Yeah, it's good. Uh, I wish I should, I should have, I should have gotten it. Uh, but... But no, I wish I had it. But see, the same thing happened again, is that we're watching it, and I'm like, this is okay. I don't really know. I know Richard holds this film in high esteem, and I don't know why. And then I fall asleep because I've eaten carbs, and I wake up, and it's a gothic horror film <laughs> with with incest. And I'm like, I had to rewind and go back because Elizabeth wasn't paying attention. And I said, what happened? And she said, I have no idea. Yep. I'm as shocked. I'm as shocked as you are. So no, I really, I really do enjoy this. I think it really fits into um, a category of a very, very dreamlike film. Oh yeah. The uh, it's funny you mentioned the editing because this editor is famous, dude. Uh, this is uh, an Italian guy named Sergio Montanari. Uh, first thing he freaking edited Django. Really? He edited. Texas Adios, God Forgives I Don't, and that's just a random sampling of the Westerns. Wow. And then you move into the 70s, he freaking edited Devil in the Brain. Speaking of Gialli, oh. speaking of Gialli that desperately need a Blu-ray, folks, 1972's Devil in the Brain. He freaking, so good. He edited Revolver. He edited. Oh, nice. He edited "Plot of Fear." "Plot of Fear" came back to see us. He edited wow. "Star Crash." <laughs> Star Crash. Holy Scott McDonald's shit. ears pricked up. He's like, "Wait, someone mentioned Star Crash. Someone mentioned Star somebody Crash. mentioned Star Crash." Yeah, this dude is credited with 167 films for his editing work. So yeah, major, major stuff. That's very cool. Um, did you ever watch uh, uh, "Freaking uh, Nightmares in a Damaged Brain"? Yes, yes, I did. That's a that's a movie. <laughs> it was uh, it was actually a a very good print of it. Nice. Uh... Disliked it, and I don't know if it's mostly because of the way it was, or if it's because they just kept sending me that movie instead <laughs> of the one that I wanted. It's hard to like. I I think it's got that reputation. It's one of those uh, video uh-huh. nasty. One of the, I mean, it's a video nasty for a reason. I see why people would have want to censor that film but it's just so florida and so weird and i was always Mm -hmm. under the impression that it was super italian but it's like Mm -hmm. barely italian (laughs) yeah it's it's american it's basically an american film but no i i like it but it's like it's one of those films i'm going to struggle with like getting rid of because i'm notorious about weeding stuff out of my collection and i can't let it go yet i'm not ready to let it go i think it might just be the florida shit because Love Florida Probably. movies. Oh, my Lord. I still stand by my very mild criticism that they don't really lean into the music enough. I think if this had a more, like, a theme, like a more, like, catchy, even if it's a minor key, it doesn't have to be happy. Uh, the dude, um, composer, he did some, like, really, some really upbeat stuff for other movies. It doesn't need that, per se, but I really wish this had had, like, a theme that it kind of leaned into to kind of fill mm-hmm. in those quiet moments. My other criticism is, yes, this is a slow, methodically paced movie. It's a slow burn. This is one of his slowest ones. And because mm-hmm. so much crazy shit happens at the end, it feels like a little unbalanced. But it's got 
the the understated stuff in it. It's got the freaking um that delicate lighting, like everything just looks so pretty. Um, once again, I'm watching a Jose Ramon Laraz movie in four three, like the full frame mm-hmm. kind of shot. Um, I don't yep. think I've seen a movie of his in widescreen other than Vampires. Mm-hmm. I think Vampires might be widescreen. Most of his movies are shot in that weird four three thing. Mm-hmm. And I do, it's really interesting. I don't know of any filmmaker that shot that stuff on purpose like that because symptoms, the Blu-ray is in the same ratio. Yep. And the, the bootleg that we had forever. Yeah. Same way. And I always assume that we were just watching the cropped VHS version of his movies, but they think that was his mm-hmm. like preferred way of shooting. But apparently so. Um, the locations in this are incredible, especially the mansion at the end. All the, oh, the, absolutely. Yeah, the sets are great. Um, even the stuff that um, at his his house in like in the the city is really nice too. Mm-hmm. They're they're all shot really well. Mm-hmm. Camera work incredible. The the fisheye lens gets busted out at some point, and it's just oh the ghoulish moments, the scares. I can't believe this scares me still. Like it gets me with mm-hmm. a jump scare. I I I I I I I I I get the vibe multiple times in this. Like I hit I hit that. Oh, then that's why I really was excited to get around to talking about this guy. Yes. When we recorded last week, you said I said let's let's record again next week. Yeah. And you said stigma, and it just so happened that here where I record in the library, I have a stack of DVDs. And out of the thousands of DVDs that I own, Stigma was in that stack sitting right beside me. <laughs> nice. I like the ambitiousness of this movie, too, because it's two films in one. You get all the psychic phenomena. Like you said, mm-hmm. the carry, uh, trying to play up to the the, the freaking uh, fury. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, with, you know, one one hundred thousandth of the budget. And then mm-hmm. if you just all of a sudden you're in this past life regression ghosty movie. It's very interesting. It um, is, absolutely. But yeah, I look forward to coming back to LaRaz at some point. Hey, let's talk about mm-hmm. him now. All right, let's do it. I'm going to let you go first. All right, I'm going to pick my top three, uh, and Brad's going to do his top five. Uh, Six. So, oh, yeah, ooh, look at that. You got so many. So I'm looking at his movies here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say this movie could be my number one Mm -hmm. um but symptoms says fuck you i'm number one (laughs) because symptoms is right the best um amazing oh my god um i would think the next one would be probably vampires but i don't reach for vampires anymore i want to watch it again soon but i Mm -hmm. that was my introduction to his work and a lot of people, I would say, exactly. Any a lot of people who came into his his movies, you know, in the early two thousands, mid two thousands, that was the film uh, that you could find of his easily mm-hmm. that wasn't you know porn. And of course, um, Black Candles. Uh, oh my God, Black Candles <laughs> is so amazing, <laughs> folks. At oh, folks boy. at home, hey, if you love Black Candles, more power to you. Um, absolutely that is my kryptonite i reject that film rejects me i reject it i can't i can't go that goat business get that goat out of Mm -hmm. my face y'all um but my real number three is i think i'm gonna go vampires but honestly edge of the axe is trying to creep in there dude (laughs) yeah it is. i freaking love edge of the axe um edge of the axe it was so good. It made me like rest in pieces mm-hmm. less because we had that boom, boom, boom of like LaRaz coming out there on was Blu-ray. Three bloody yeah. manor, uh, de- rest in pieces, dead, deadly manor. Uh huh. Deadly manor is super good. I like it, but rest in pieces was a bit of a disappointment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's my three point seven two five. What is your What is your six? All right, so I had five, and then I made it six. Six would be Stigma. Nice. It would be higher if I had the Blu-ray, no doubt. (laughs) Five is Whirlpool, which is his debut film. Nice. Um, 
it's a sexy thriller, but not a sexy thriller. <laughs> uh, there's on the, the we've got the DVD, the Blu-ray set of uh, Vampires, Whirlpool, and um, The Coming of Sin, which I haven't watched. And uh, Tim, obviously, he always does did a really good informative podcast uh, podcast commentary. Four would be Vampires. Nice. Uh, I think it's I think it's an excellent film. Three would be Edge of the Axe. I really really enjoyed Edge of the Axe. Out of the three of those that we were talking about a minute ago, that's my favorite. Nice. Two would be The House That Vanished, also known Ooh. as Scream mm. and Die. Yes. That's another one that I got from Netflix. It is it's a terrible <laughs> a terrible looking dude DVD. I uh, so I have a download that's uh, much better. Yeah, much better. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I can. Uh, yeah. I know a guy who can send it yeah. to you. Yeah, tell that guy that ah, this guy would like to hear from him. <laughs> the plot is easy to follow. I mean, there's not any surprises, <laughs> but I I really that was like I think that was my uh, after vampires. That was my next film from Loraz. Sweet. And then, of course, number one is Symptoms. And yeah. that, I mean, it was going to be, yeah. there, there was only going to be Symptoms because I think that, I think that's just his best film. Yeah. It's, uh, we, we covered it back episode two, five or ten was or it? something. It was, I, it was in the, the early one. Yeah. Let me take a look. I, I'm actually very curious. So, does that count as your question time or did you have another? You... No, that's my question oh, time nice. for this. Is that Sweet. I, I sent it to you so we could do our top Loraz films. Oh, yeah. No, Symptoms was number six. Number I six. I kept thinking it was number two, but that number two was next of Kin. This was back when I would say, Richard, I saw a trailer or I saw this or saw that. And it. Sorry, the witch is talking. It, it, it doesn't have a release. Can you find it? And you always did. Yeah. Like that. I tried. It was amazing. Magic. Yeah. We do have some double features. We got a we got a freaking double feature it up. So folks, we've been doing the new thing Brad cooked up where we talk about a freaking random double feature. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, Brad, why don't you go first since I got to go first for uh, all right the listy. I had one, and I thought I was going to stick with it. And now remember, these films they could be alike, they could be disparate. They, I mean, could have like the same star, it's whatever. It's there's no there's no rules. Yeah. And I had one that I was gonna go with, but I think it has changed since we've been sitting here talking. I would say watch two of the greatest uh, vampire films of the 1970s and go with Loraz's Vampires Ooh. and Daughters of Dar Darkness. Oh my God! Yes. I think that would make Woo. a great double feature. And, I, I, and listen, it's not rocket science either. I'm sure plenty <laughs> of you have thought, you know, there will be films hopefully coming where maybe I will have something a little more challenging. Yeah. Uh, I think what I had picked originally would be something more challenging, but just sitting here, it makes me want to go put in Vampires and then da Daughters of Darkness. Nice, nice. I was having trouble. I, we were on the phone and I was staring at my shelves trying to think of something. And I had mm -hmm. picked a great first feature, but then I picked something with such a unique tone that I'm going to have to have more time to think about it. So that's in the future. Gotcha. I saw something and then I was like, what would that go with? Okay. The theme is mm -hmm. you're at a drive-in. It's 1980 and you're getting a new movie. And a movie that is still making the rounds. That's been out for a few okay. years. And maybe you've seen the one that's been out for a few years, but you love it. And you realize your brain's about to get melted by these two films back to back. All right. The first film is Shockwaves. Shockwaves. The Nazi zombie movie. Yes. To end all Nazi zombie movies. Absolutely. And... With the frickin' second feature, Strange Behavior, a.k.a. Ooh. Dead Kids. Yeah, that is a great double feature. I was like, man, that would make my night when I was a frickin' uh, person who only went to a drive-in like twice in his whole life. 
<laughs> Amazing. No, that's a that's a, that's exactly that strikes at the very heart of what I wanted double features to be. Yeah, dude. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Woo! Dude, we did it. We did. So, we did this. We did. Can we throw out some shout outs? Please bring it. My list of shout outs are David Ladd, friend of the show. Hell yeah. Him and his wife have a movie podcast that we've discussed, The Movie Clinic. Check it out. Uh, Lanny, my cousin in law, Lanny, listens to the show. Yay. Mark. Mark, you know who you are. Huge friend of the show. Super nice guy. Totally. Tedador Rossum, <laughs> which is who is awesome. Uh, I talked to him quite a bit. Uh, somebody that I talked to this very week because Veronica Carlson died, and that's Court Psyops. Yes. We cover, him and I covered Dracula Rises from the Grave many moons ago. Nice. Scott McDonald, who we talked about about Star Crash a minute ago. And then all the, the, the you know, the co-hosts of the show, uh, Jeffrey, Simon, and of course, Nafa. Uh, wherever he is <laughs> wherever he is just a huge a huge thank you margie i always want to mention margie because she was she was one of the very first friends of the show that's right uh, an enabler never an enabler never did find those dragons <laughs> but maybe maybe she's had more luck now yeah and of course Le- lietta and elizabeth because they indulge, indulge us. The podcast widows, yep. <laughs> That's right. So it's just it's so it's eleven years. It's hard to believe. Yeah, dude. Other and other other shows have like they're on episode twelve hundred and six by now. Yeah. But yeah, but that's how that's how we still are on. We're now. about we are about quantity, not quality. And that's yeah, always been our, exactly. our thing. <laughs> yeah. If you told me 11 years ago, 11 years, you'll get to 250, I'd have been like, hmm. Mm, what happened? And of course, <laughs> you've been on every single, you've been on every single show. I did not want to do this for episode 250. And then I got to thinking, hey, asshole, <laughs> you, you come around and do as you please. And Richard makes this show well, here, here, in so your, stop, be, stop being a dumbass in your defense in your defense i was i was like lietta i think i feel bad for for picking this for episode 250 and she went wait this what we just watched i was like yeah <laughs> dude i love this one she's like okay i'm like oh and she's like no it's okay you like it and i'm like oh no what have i done i like it <laughs> I did not. I did not put on any so false pretenses. Funny. It was so funny. at all. I'm gonna have to tell Elizabeth that. That's funny. <laughs> Wait, what? What we just watched? <laughs> that I always want to quote her because uh, Lietta, one of my favorite movies of the last like freaking four or five years was Lose from 2018, and we watched Lose, uh-huh. and uh, I was so excited to show it to her. And I was like watching her watch it. I was all like bouncing up and down in my freaking chair and like when it was over I was like uh-huh. I was like well and she goes is that it oh no <laughs> best three word freaking uh review ever dude <laughs> amazing is that it <laughs> no I am such a huge fan oh, of Leanna I'm I'm not a friend of the show I am a fan yeah of dude she's gonna be back we got some episodes planned I've been uh trying to make it um so that she and I can record uh, together easier because it was just just sitting around this microphone and setting mm-hmm. it on the the directional the multi directional setting and it's not not good. But I tested the thing with Sam, so I have a much better way to record us. I actually give uh, give e- our, each of us our own microphone. Gotcha. And that turned out like spectacularly well with Sam because I think that. That episode with Sam sounds incredible. Amazing. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna do it up. Get Leah to back. But man, thank you. Uh, you, and- you you started this stuff. You were like, "Hey, man, let's do a podcast." And I said, "No, no, no." No, I don't. I, I <laughs> you wish you'd stuck with it. I don't remember. I don't. I guess. I guess I started this bullshit. But no, dude, you've always been there. Even when you weren't on the show, you were like the freaking inspiration behind this whole thing. 
And well, uh, I appreciate that. I always tell everybody if uh, if Brad ever like leaves the show or leaves the planet or freaking runs away with the circus, I'm not gonna call it "Hello, this is the Doom Show" anymore because it wouldn't seem the same without you. Oh, it just I. I appreciate that so much, and I'll tell you how much this has meant to my family. I texted my dad, recording episode number 250, and he said, of what? <laughs> and I said, our podcast, Hello, This is Doom Show, and he texted back, sure. Too much going on here to have made that connection. I said, no worries. And you're like, all right, what's going on? And then when he tells you like this long answer of what's happening at the house, just text back a uh-huh. bunch of Zs. Yeah. Like you're snoring. <laughs> yeah. Amy Amy Green and her husband Dan, yeah, they dude. used to listen. I don't know if they still do. Uh Nashy Cast for being the inspiration. Oh yeah. Um I've always thought it was funny where I said I uh typed Paul Nashy into iTunes and they came up as a podcast and then I, they they're from the Nashville area. Mm-hmm. So, like, I'm only about an hour north of them. They're a big reason why we, this inspiration to do this. Yeah, dude. They're still going strong, too. Yeah, just a solid, solid podcast. So, Rod's doing the Bloody Pit. Uh Uh-huh. And I can't remember if freaking Troy's still on with him. The only movie podcast that I listen to is David and Sherry's The Movie Clinic. Yeah. I listen to podcasts on, I like, Astonishing Legends. Yeah. And I listen to a football podcast, college football. But otherwise, I listen to Hello, This is the Doom Show, the episode of your favorite slashers of the yeah. day. And I just got the biggest kick out of it. I need to listen to more of you and Simon together. Of course. Jeffrey, I never talked to Jeffrey uh, we used to uh, message a little bit about books. Yeah. I understand that he is stupid busy. He's crazy so I busy. I to bother him. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm real bad about movie podcasts, too. I'm I'm, uh, I'm on an unspooled kick. I like unspooled. Uh, mm. I'm still waiting for Hollywood Gauntlet to come back. They've only been gone for seven years. Yeah, I should probably... that was after the saloon went down. Yeah, I should probably give up waiting on them. <laughs> Well, you think? Do you really think the the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, table read probably set them under? No, they did ones after that. I think. Well, I mean, but do you think that was the start of what of the downfall? Uh, hey, they put a lot of work into something I found unlistenable. Right. Good for them. And I listened to their six hour podcast on the Godfather movies four or five times. Just to give wow. just to give you an idea of what my job is like, I can listen to shows while doing mind numbing work. So mm-hmm. I've listened to a six hour podcast four or five times. <laughs> Man, I enjoyed that one. Folks, if you haven't checked it out yet, speaking of Jeffrey, you need to hear Super Chillers. Super Chillers? What's that? Super Chillers is uh Jeffrey and his pal Katie doing um an episodes doing an episodes doing episodes about uh young adult horror fiction books and Super you can read the book beforehand or not they go through the whole thing and so if you don't plan on reading it just freaking check it out um they have a great chemistry and it's just a super super professional fun show i i am blown away by uh the quality of that show it's it's really 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 good I am subscribed through Podcast Attic. Yeah. And so I'm looking and they did Silent Stalker by RTC. Yeah. I Missing by R.L. Stein. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know any of the books they're talking about. <laughs> no, so far I don't either. <laughs> but they're they're so fun and it's just good stuff. Yeah, I can't recommend that enough. And of course, yeah, like Brad said, movie clinic. With uh, Dave and Sherry, you gotta listen to Movie Clinic. Oh yeah, they are. They are. Oh yeah, they such a freaking fun couple. I am. Uh, Boy, they are. And they have opinions that are just like, pfft. some sometimes Sherry goes off the rails for me, but it's never like I'm mad at her or anything. She just has a different opinion. Right. And David's like the best guy in the world. Yeah, he's so he's so chill, and they they've got obviously they've got chemistry, and like I said last week on the. Uh, Iguana with the Tongue of Fire show, um, 
their Halloween kills bonus was was it was a lot of fun. Nice. I really enjoyed it. Nice. Good kids, those two. Folks, we did it. We made it to the end of this long episode. We Yeah, we did. Gorgon is yawning. And if folks, if you don't have a cat who has no teeth, uh, you don't know how hilariously cute and ugly a cat is when they yawn that has no teeth. It's amazing. Yeah. So I have I have a cat with no teeth and a dog with no teeth. <laughs> you got a cat with one totally black uh, pupil eye like David Bowie. Yeah. And her tongue yep. sticks out all the time, just like David Bowie. Yep. And Winnie's tongue sticks out all the time, and she's got she gums everything. Do their tongues ever touch? Do they ever like bump tongues? No, they don't. They don't get close to each other. Oh, bless their hearts. I think I think they. I think both the cats marvel at Winnie at this <laughs> thing in the cage. They're like, "How old is that little guy over there?" Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> she will be uh, Winnie this this month. March will be seventeen. <laughs> Oh my god, that's amazing! She, she was the runt of the litter, and I bet, I bet money. We'll never know, but I bet money she's the only one still living. Dude, seventeen years young, I love it. Man, <laughs> she's she's something else. Uh, well, Brad, have a wonderful time not recording this, and I'll talk to you in the future. Yes, as I will be talked to in the future as well. And goodbye to the listeners for now. Just for now. TTFN. Yes. LMAO. Bye. Bye. Hello, This is the Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on legionpodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, This is the Doom Show, go to hellodoomshow.podomatic.com or go to doomedmoviethon.com for the archives. If that's still not enough, go to at doomedmoviethon on Twitter. You can write in to Hello, This is the Doom Show, use the email doomedmoviethon at gmail.com. Doom Show episodes are available on record and 8-track cassette.